Hello, everyone. My name is Naomi Smith, and I'm so excited to welcome you to our second Voting Rights in Black America Brain Trust session, Why Black Women Leadership Matters. We have a dynamic panel for you today, and you'll hear some from the most brilliant Black women um, in politics today. So before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Executive Leadership Council, Union Pacific Railroad, Lyft, and STARS. Now, I'd like to introduce our first sponsor speaker, Ms. Crystal Ashby. Crystal Ashby is the interim president and CEO of the Executive Leadership Council, the preeminent organization for Black CEOs, board of directors, and the most senior Black executives at Fortune 1000, Global 500, and equivalent companies. She leads the organization's efforts to increase the number of global Black executives in C-suites on corporate boards and in global enterprises. She is the first woman president CEO of the organization and traces her association with the ELC to her participation in the first class of the ELC's Strengthening the Pipeline Leadership Development Program. Ms. Ashby is an accomplished senior executive, board member, and lawyer with more than 34 years of experience, significantly, significantly in the energy sector. Her corporate leadership was gained over a 22 year career with BP, where her role spans from government and external affairs, law, compliance, ethics, university relations, and retail. Thank you, Ms. Ashby, and we welcome your remarks. Thank you, Naomi, it's good to see you again. Good afternoon and welcome to everyone joining us today. The Executive Leadership Council is honored to serve as a partner on today's important voter issue forum hosted by the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. At the ELC, we are working to ensure every eligible voter is ready and registered to exercise their voice, their vote, and their power in the November elections next week. Thank you CBCF for this opportunity to partner with you to ensure everyone is registered to vote and educated on all the issues affecting our community. One of the ELC's most valuable investments this year has been supporting organizations and efforts committed to registering people to vote, specifically our people, the black community, because our voice is critical in shaping the future of our communities. Our nation is at a critical moment and everyone must know the leaders we have to elect in November will make decisions that affect our lives forever. You have the power to impact the direction of this country by voting. Now let's talk about black women, the sisters. Black women have and continue to play a monumental role in driving our community's shared goal. Black women are leading the resistance in and out of government. Our collective impact and power has been a driving force for our communities this fall in encouraging robust civic engagement efforts. Being leaders like that is not new for us. At least 61 black women, 48 Democrats and 13 Republicans will appear on ballots across the country for Congress in November. This number is markedly higher than the previous record of 41 black women congressional candidates, which was set in 2018. A record number of black women also took part in the primary contest for majority party house nominations this year as well. Black women have outvoted men in every presidential election since 1980. Let's pause. Let's think about that. And let me say it again. Black women have outvoted men in every presidential election since 1980. We vote our values, but with the increasing social tensions and awareness, this time feels different. Black women are stepping into our power unlike any other time. Black women's buying power is typically higher than others. You cannot ignore the dollars. Our economic power is impactful, yet it's too often undervalued. And that's why today's conversation is so important. 2020 is a critical year for women, for black women. The pandemic has forced more caretaking on women and we're losing jobs in greater numbers than men. Black women are being hit the hardest. So now is the time for us to fight harder, to claim the power that belongs to us, to use our voices at the polls, in our communities, wherever you see a need. The good news is that we are in this fight together as is evidenced by the women you see on this screen. 
So let's keep going. We can make a difference because we still have good trouble to get into. Thank you all so much and enjoy this conversation. Thank you for kicking off our session, Ms. Ashby. I'm so excited to just to watch everyone hear and learn from you all. Now I'd like to introduce our second sponsor remarks from Ms. Tanya Conley. Ms. Conley is the Senior General Attorney for Union Pacific Railroad. She joined the organization in 2006 and has advanced through a variety of roles in the law department. Tanya is a leader on the commercial legal team of Union Pacific Railroad Company, responsible for providing leadership and guidance for a variety of corporate matters, including strategic sourcing, bankruptcy, credit, regulatory, antitrust, real estate, and commercial transactions. Tanya is also currently the president of the Omaha chapter of the Union Pacific Black, Net Black Employee Network a 30-year-old employee resource group that is dedicated to recruiting, retaining, developing, and advancing the career of Black employees at Union Pacific. Please welcome Ms. Con Conley. Hi, thank you. Uh, I am thrilled to be part of this discussion today. Um, Union Pacific values its longstanding partnership and the con with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation and is happy to sponsor today's panel discussion. Union Pacific understands the significant role that Black women play, not only in advancing our company's goals of an inclusive and equitable workplace, but also in cultivating truly representative and equitable systems that influence and drive our communities. UP has long supported its diverse talent. Union Pacific's Black Employee Network established over 30 years ago and LEAD, its employee resource group supporting women were some of the first ERGs in the industry with Ben being one of the first. And UP continues to aggressively drive leadership diversity as we look toward the future with a goal of doubling female representation in our workforce by 2030. Black women have an important voice that should not only be part of the conversation, but lead the conversation. UP embraces that voice and is working to advance opportunities for development, career advancement, and leadership for our talent. As black women leaders and voters, we have a unique perspective, power and strength. And when we step into our power, the effect is game changing. Our ability to embrace our culture and community and use the challenges that we have faced as a unifying and compassionate force in our leadership ultimately drives increased engagement and, effect and effectiveness, propelling our organizations and communities forward to more equitable and optimal outcomes. We must harness our power today, especially on Tuesday and into the future to drive impactful and lasting change. Thank you so much, Ms. Conley. And now I'm so excited and honored to present to you this brief presentation on behalf of our sponsors, Lyft, from the Miss Valerie Jarrett. Hello, everyone. I'm Valerie Jarrett, and I am just delighted to once again have an opportunity to join the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation and lift up the important work that we're doing together around voting rights. 2020 has been such a tough year for all of us. And for Black women, the backbone of so many families and communities, we have continued to bear more than our fair share of the national struggles. Nevertheless, I am hopeful because we have seen so much activism on the streets of our country, people calling for change, people of all ages, of all backgrounds, of all ages, willing to say Black Lives Matter. And we're beginning to see change at the local level and there's been a call for change at the national level. And Black women have stepped up to lead that call for change and our voices are being heard. Now, with just days before the most important election of our lifetime, we are focused again on voting. Black women, who've already had some of the highest voter rates in the country are stepping up. Women recognize that our rights are on the ballot. Our health care is on the ballot. Economic equality is on the ballot. But the COVID-19 pandemic and efforts to suppress our vote have forced us to grapple with new barriers to voting. In the last presidential election, it's estimated that more than 14 million people did not vote in large part because they lacked a way to get to the polls. Voters in communities of color where a lack of transportation 
can be a particular problem to voting, but they are eager to vote, need help. And that's what we intend to do. Our work at Lyft is intended to bridge that transportation gap and help remove some of the more difficult challenges around voting. So this year, Lyft has activated our Lyft Up Voting Access Program in partnership with nearly 20 not-for-profits around the country, including the National Urban League, to distribute free and discounted rides to the polls. We are also continuing our work with existing partners such as the Black Women's Roundtable, the National Federation of the Blind, and Student Veterans for America. Lyft has partnered with When We All Vote, where I serve as board chair, and we are working to ensure that every registered voter has a voting plan. We're working with More Than a Vote, the Social Change Fund, and HBCU Heroes to offer access to discounted rides to the polls on election day. Next week, on election day, we're offering 50% off on one ride of up to $10 to any polling location or drop off if you use the code 2020VOTE. That's 2020VOTE. This is, this is so essential that we participate. 43% of registered voters didn't vote in the last presidential election, nearly 100 million Americans. We have an opportunity to change that this time. We need every single person in this country to register to vote. And I'm so proud that Lyft is trying to make that a little easier. Our turnout is going to affect the outcome of the election. And we've seen what great things can happen when black women have their voices heard. So I ask you to make a plan and backup plan and a backup backup plan. Vote early if you can. Figure out how you can do it in a way that's safe. And then please ask everybody in your network to do the same. We're counting on you. Thank you. Wow. That was great. It's so it's so cool and great to hear like organizations like Lyft doing what they can to help people get out the vote because it's so important in this election. So now I'm so excited to introduce our moderator for today's session, Ms. Jakota Edie. Ms. Jakota Edie is the founder and CEO of Full Circle Strategies, a social impact consulting firm committed to advancing transformative change and global impact. Described as the Olivia Pope of Silicon Valley by Forbes magazine, Jakota is dedicated and, and a seasoned strategist with more than 20 years of experience in policy, advocacy, move, and movement building. Within her current practice, Jakota works with clients including corporate, nonprofit foundations, technology, and government organizations seeking to advance policy, ideas, and change. Jakota leads regulatory, legislative, and social impact initiatives at the federal and state level for leading nonprofits and within the C-suite of leading technology companies, helping to bridge the gap between Washington, D.C. and Silicon Valley. So I know she'll moderate a great session, and thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, and it's really always an honor to spend time with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really excited about this conversation. I'm more excited about the panelists that we're going to engage with. So let's get started. I want to introduce our panelists and actually get into the conversation. I'm going to start with introducing Ms. Ashanti Golar. Uh, I'm excited. Uh, I actually feel like I'm just having a girlfriend's talk um, because I know most of these ladies and have worked with them and just uh, uh, and know the work that you're leading. So Ashanti Golar is the president of Emerge. And as the president of Emerge, which is the only organization dedicated to recruiting and training Democratic women to run for office, she leads the organization and steers its overall strategy and direction, overseeing the national staff as well as its affiliates across the country. I must also add that Ashanti is a longtime political strategist, very well known for her political strategy and the work that she does to make sure that we center black and brown women. She has an award, an award winning podcast. If you have not checked out the Brown Girls Guide to Politics, you should check it out because it has been named one of the top political podcasts by Time Magazine and Marie Claire. Next, uh, we will go to Nadia Brown. Nadia is the Associate Professor of Political Science and African American Studies at Purdue University. She's also the author of Sisters in the State House, 
Black women and legislative decision-making and distinct identities, minority women in US politics. Nadia has a long history of studying the intersection of gender, politics, and also the intersection of political sciences in this space. And we're really excited to hear about all of the great work and the academic work that she has brought to this most important conversation. Last but certainly not least, uh, it's such an honor to have the Leah Daughtry, the Bishop Leah Daughtry amongst us. Uh, Leah is the national presiding prelate of the House of Lord of Churches, the fourth in secession. She was installed in October of 2019. In addition to leading in this most prestigious space, Leah is a longtime political strategist. She is really a dean of political strategy, serving as a uh, guide to many of us brown girls in politics. She served as the CEO of the DNC convention twice, the only person in the entire country and dare I say world to serve in this capacity in two uh, consecutive terms. She gave us the beauty of the nomination of then Senator Barack Obama, President Barack Obama and also uh, Secretary Hillary Clinton. In addition to that, Leah is the founder of Power Rising, which is an organization meant to uplift, galvanize and center black women in politics. Hello, panelists, how are you doing? We are very close to an historic election. And I wanna get us started with the question. Um, our topic today is black women in politics. So we heard uh, uh, the conversation prior to the start of this, this panel. Um, and there's just a conversation around the country right now about black women. We know that black women's leadership in politics is incredibly important. I want to just hear from each of the panelists, and I'll start with you, Nadia, uh, from your point of view. Why are Black women important in the politics, and why particularly in this moment? Well, thank you. And it's such an honor to share space with you all. My, it makes my Black girl heart proud uh, to be able to, to be here amongst you all. So as Joteka shared, I'm an expert in Black women's politics. I, my research most um, prominently focuses on Black women elected officials and candidates, and I've also moved over to do some work on Black women voters. The thing that I've come to, to share with you today is why does Black women's leadership matter? It matters because Black women bring a different set of issues and policy priorities that otherwise would not be at the legislative decision-making table. In my own research, I've seen that Black women do things that electing white, white women or Black men just won't get us. Um, so this idea that you can elect someone that shares a same racial identity or gendered identity and get the kind of outcomes that Black women need, that's just um, factually incorrect. So some examples of this are issues that are particularly of importance to Black women that they experience outside of what Black men or white women, like Black maternal health, the high rates of Black infant mortality, or there are other issues like um, set aside programs for businesses and um, doing work with the state. So minority business enterprise zones that have often looked at women and uh, minorities as two separate entities, which let women of color um, kind of have this loophole of figuring out which, um, which program they should apply to. And instead, black women at the legislative decision-making table have said, what about us, right? These policies need to be re-looked at and they need to be um, ways that are, they need to be ways that black women are included as opposed to being this loosey-goosey kind, of, um, kind of outlet. The other things that, that we know that Black women matter is because they save American politics. So we saw this most um, prevalent in the 2017 special election of Doug Jones in the Alabama Senate race, where celebrities, political operatives, and the like all thanked Black women for delivering that much, um, much needed Senate seat to the Democrats. The black woman turned around and said, we didn't, we didn't save America and democracy for you. We did this for ourselves. And so black women are reasserting their own role in American policy and politics um, as, as these saviors that are really delivering these democratic seats, but are doing so not for the party, but for themselves. And I want to talk a little bit about that um, as we go through the question and answer period. And then the other thing that black women do that I'll, I'll end with this is they think about politics as a collective. They talk about we 
us community as opposed to thinking about politics for me or for I. And in my research that I've done with, um, with Black women elected officials, they all come around to what electing me is a voice for the community. So I'll end there, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. Now I wanna take it over to you, Ashanti. Black women mattering in this most historic moment. Just give us your, your thoughts here on why black women, black women matter in politics, but particularly in this moment. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. I'm Ashanti Golar. I'm the president of Emerge. Very excited to be here with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation and all of these amazing Black women. One of the things that I've been saying a lot is that we're actually in the middle of two pandemics, a health pandemic with COVID and a racial injustice pandemic. And we look at the policies that have been set forth over these past few months is Black women elected officials and leaders who have been shaping this policy and who have been setting the way for others about this is how you should guide and lead your communities. We know that it was Mayor London Breed, the first black woman mayor of San Francisco, a major city mayor to start having people shelter in place. If you actually look at what she was talking about on Twitter the day that she was calling for people to stay at home, you had male mayors of other cities telling people to go about their business, that this was no big deal. She took a lot of heat for being direct, decisive, and frankly, efficient. She saved a lot of people's lives in San Francisco. We'd look at Rachel Rollins, who is the first black woman DA in Suffolk County in Massachusetts. We did say home is the safest place to make sure that you don't catch COVID, but she was the first one to raise her hand and say, hey, Home is actually not the safest place for victims of domestic violence and abuse. We need to make sure that we're issuing emergency protective orders so that these women, these children, these families have a safe place to go. And because of her history being a victim rights advocate, that is what she was bringing to the table. You didn't have anyone else thinking about that impact. We look at Jennifer Carol Foy. She is in the Virginia House of Delegates. She was one of the women who flipped the seat in 2017. She's now running to be governor of Virginia. She would be the first woman governor of Virginia, the first black woman governor in our country. Her main thing was to make sure that we were able to have safe, fair, mail, vote by mail elections in Virginia. And I say that because I live in Virginia. So I'm really grateful to her for that because I was able to safely vote by mail. And I actually live right next to the post office. So it was super easy for me to drop off my ballot. And then we see women like Leslie Harrod, who was the first black openly LGBTQ woman elected in Colorado. She immediately made sure that we are focusing on police reform in her city, in her state, and then that was enacted. So as we're living through these times, these historical times, when we look back at history books, it's going to be black women who are at the forefront of shaping our policies. It's their leadership that is getting us through. And at Emerge, we have 672 alums that are gonna be on the November 3rd ballot, including Congresswoman Lucy McBath, and it's their leadership that we need during this time. I'm always saying, yes, we know that black women voters were always at the top, but we don't always have to be the voters. We need to be the ones putting our name on the ballot because we know the issues. We know what our community needs. We know how to get things done. It's time for us to stop voting for everyone else to get it done and for us to have that seat at the table to get it done, but not just have that seat at the table to shake the table to make sure that we're doing everything possible to better our communities. Well, thank you for that, Ashanti. Leah, I wanna to go to you. You have been in politics for many years. I'm not gonna say how many, you can choose to say how many, but you have seen really the evolution of black women in politics, knowing that we have always been there. I mean, even from the launch of the women's suffrage movement, black women was right there, you know, front and center, even though they were forced to pushed to the back, they were always there. And you have been there for a very long time. Can you speak on this moment, why Black women matter in politics? Well, thank you, Joteka, uh, for the question and to the CBCF for 
uh, this opportunity to really have this dialogue uh, with my sister panelists and with those who are listening. I'm gonna try to keep my answer short. I'm looking forward to the Q&A from the audience. So I'm gonna try to uh, say what I wanna say and, and resist the temptation to be a preacher uh, in this moment. Um, this is a really historic moment. And part of it is having Kamala Harris on the ticket. Uh, she's certainly not the first black woman. Of course, we know Charlotta Bass. Uh, was on a major party ticket some years ago, uh, but she is uh, critical in this particular sphere. And what we're seeing now, um, Dr. Brown talked about black women acting as a collective and acting in the collective, but we don't just think in the collective, we act in the collective, whether we're joining organizations, whether we're moving our own organizations that we're already members of, like our sororities, like our churches, like our unions, uh, or whether we're creating new organizations that help to do the work. And we've, so that, so that we've reached this intersection in time where we are both leading organizations, moving organizations, starting organizations, as well as more, having more comfort in stepping to the forefront to actually lead in electoral office, in businesses, at, at, at academies. So all of this conjoins at this, at this particular moment. So everywhere you look, there is a black woman in leadership. And we don't just think about our families, we act as, as a group. No black woman, see if you can find one, does anything by themselves. You always got your girl with you. You always call in somebody to come with you to do whatever it is you're doing. And when we step into these big enterprises, these highlighted high profile opportunities, trust there is a sister that you brought with me, a sister or 10. And that's the way we run our lives. That's the way we have survived these 400 years in this country by rolling as a collective. We don't have, we've never, never had the luxury of thinking about only ourselves, only what's good for me. The only way we could survive through enslavement, through Jim Crow, through civil rights to the present time is by working and acting collectively, hand in hand, arm in arm, sometimes seen and sometimes not seen, but working and walking in the collective. You know, Leah, you can go ahead and preach now. I think we could we could use a good preach going into this election. But I wanna I wanna double click on a point that you made that black women, when we go, we are not just thinking about ourselves, but that we're not just moving by ourselves, but we're acting as a collective, which has led to what we know st statistically, and we heard it earlier on that black women vote. We're the highest voting block in the entire nation that we have outvoted men. Black women have outvoted men, not, not just black men, but outvoted men uh, consistently over and over again, that we are the most loyal, we're the most consistent, but we have not always been seen. We have not always been the most respected nor the most valued. So I, I, I wanna go to you, Ashanti, because your work really is about training and ensuring that women and black women understand their power, but run for office. Can you speak a bit about the transformation of, of, of more black women running for office and what that has meant for the policies and the issues that impact black women and their families? Absolutely, and I'm gonna keep my answer short, but we have to realize that we commemorated the 100th anniversary of the 19th amendment, but that was only a hundred years for some women. That did not include black, brown, and indigenous women. So I always tell people it has not been 100 years for us. It's been 1965 and after. So frankly, we're playing catch up. So when people are saying, why aren't there more black women? I don't understand. Well, guess what? We didn't have the same opportunities as everyone else. A lot of people are saying that with women running, particularly with black women running, that it's a wave. And I disagree with that. It's a movement. It's a movement of Black women taking our rightful seats at the table and owning our political power. This is how it should be. Every year, we should see more Black women running for office at all levels. But we have to realize those barriers do exist. 
We use the words electability and viability all the time. I personally can't stand those words because when you're saying, are they electable? Are they viable? What are we talking about? Straight white man. And when people go to use those words, that's immediately what they're talking about. Can they win in this district? We know that people will go to their network first when they're looking for candidates. Black women aren't in a lot of these networks. So that's why it's on us to make sure that we're encouraging the black women in our networks to run for office. Another key barrier is fundraising. They will literally give a man who doesn't have the same experience as a black woman $20,000 and give the black woman $1,000. Those fundraising barriers are real. So we have to make sure that we are helping them with a the fundraising piece. Low dollar donations, 5, 10, 15 every month, those add up. And we also have to be honest about the fact that gatekeepers are very real. They do see black women in elected office as a threat to their power because that's what it is. When there's more of us and we're owning our power, that means someone else is scared that they're not going to have the power. That's why we focus on recruiting and training women 365 days a year at Emerge. We're celebrating 15 years. Our next 15 years is gonna focus on the new American majority, particularly black, brown and indigenous women. So if we wanna to continue to see record numbers of black women running, we gotta dive in deep and all of us as black women have to make that commitment to making sure that we're asking black women to run for office and supporting those black women that are. Well, Leah, I wanna to go to you because Ashanti raised a very important point. She talked about this question of electability and we certainly saw in this political cycle, a lot of conversation about, well, is she, elect is she electability? She's too ambitious. Um, she's, um, all, I mean, everything. And you were very much a part of a movement of black women that were very vocal about not only the need for this presidential ticket to have a black woman on it as a vice presidential running mate, but you also were very much a part of a movement of black women that were very vocal in speaking out against the racism and the sexism that continues to permeate in the political conversation. Could you speak on that and just really the burden that black women particularly face in the political climate and this political election narrative that we're in right now? Well, you know, it's been it's part of the history that we have in this country that we carry the burden of both our race and our sex. If you if you want to call them burdens, I don't, but we we carry those two things on our shoulders. And in this American society, that is particularly problematic. And I want to flag this as a particularly American problem because in other countries, we're one of the last first world countries to have never elected a woman at the head of, uh, of, of our government. Other in India, <laughs> Britain, you name it, they've had women leaders. We are still the last vestige and it goes back to the founding of our nation, the people who left Europe to get away from women's leadership to come here and found a country. So we are still struggling with those things. And as black women, Women brought here uh, unwillingly, the, 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 the specter of race adds into that. So everything we do, we have this double uh, uh, burden that we're bearing or two, or two little red trucks we're wheeling behind us every step of the way. And the country is still adjusting. Our nation is still dealing with racism. So we're not going to be exempt from the country dealing with racism. The country is still dealing with sexism. So we are uh, natural um, uh, inheritors of the sexism, including from our brothers who often are battling for with us for the same space. But what we know is that black women have the talent, the capacity and the ability to run, to win and to lead. These 43 women in the Congressional Black Caucus are not all representing African-American districts. They are representing minority majority districts or they're representing a majority districts. Lauren Underwood is a great example because people understand, there is a growing understanding that when a black woman steps forward to lead, first of all, there is the boldness, 
There is the braveness. There is the fearlessness that comes to the table. But there is also our lived experience that allows us to see the voter, to see the consumer, to see the child, to see the organization in a different light. And so that, so people begin to trust us because they know there is nobody better to have on your side than a black woman if you're going into a room and you're not sure because we're going to fight. We can out talk you, we out work you, and we out fight you. And that's why we went to Joe Biden and said, Mr. Vice President, it is in your own best interest to select an African American woman to be your running mate. Number one, she's going to help you win because of the electoral map and where you need to get votes, a black woman will help you win. Number two, we deserve it. We are the most loyal voting black in the nation. 72% of black women are registered to vote and we do vote and when we go, we don't go by ourselves. We take our brothers, our uncles, our daddies, our nephews, whoever else with us. That's number two. And number three, it is the moral imperative and the historic right choice for you to put this, myth of black women's leadership to bed and to say concretely black women lead and that's why i'm selecting a black woman and he took our advice he's a very smart man to take the advice of black women i believe you can always win with black women dr brown i want to go to you because as black women are running and winning more we understand that racism and discrimination continues to increase so what do you believe that policymakers and Congress and, and others in power need to do to ensure that there's a more equitable opportunities for women, not only to run, but also to win? So I wanna piggyback on some of the comments that Ashanti um, laid out for us earlier. So in my own research, doing focus groups and one-on-one -on -one interviews with black women candidates, they're saying some of the very same things. Um, fundraising is an issue lack of party support, gatekeepers, and the gatekeepers aren't always who we think they are, right? So there are gatekeepers within black communities. There are other black women who are gatekeepers, um, issues around seniority. I've done a lot of research on black millennial and generation Z women who, um, black women who feel shut out and they are ignored and marginalized in the party. That's one of um, those three things are immediate fixes I think that would be useful. Other things are much more long-term and structural. So I think we have to really get real about the role of parties. Are parties the only place that should be recruiting and training candidates? Or can we look to other organizations who are doing a much better job than, um, than political parties are doing? Also, how are we socializing our children, ourselves and our communities around politics? So we tell everyone to get out and vote, right? We, we remind folks of the sacrifices of our ancestors have, have paid for us to vote. But we also need to remind people it's just as important to donate money, these $5, $10 a month, right? It's a socialization that needs to happen that you adding money to a political campaign can help that candidate go out and get two or three more votes. So you have this one vote in the ballot booth, but you can do more to bring in other people if you can, if you, if you donate money. So it's a different kind of conversation we need to be having in our communities around the role of, of our money and advancing candidates that, that we believe have our best interest in heart. And lastly, I think that there has to be some rearticulation of where Black women are running and where they're winning, right? So Aaliyah Dory brought up um, London Underwood, such an amazing example, right? That Black women can win, they are viable, they are electable in all places, not just these minority majority districts. And it's exactly because we are agentic, right? That we, uh, voters believe that Black women are going to be the ones that can speak up and have the leadership traits that white women frankly don't have. So this kind of bifurcated way that we're thinking about gender and politics, black women just don't have these issues. So I think if we rearticulate um, why black women are so electable and do this outside of just majority minority communities is a great first step. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. I wanna dive into this. There's been this conversation and I, 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 I believe it's important to have the conversation. I believe how we're having the conversation sometimes can be not as helpful, but this conversation to create this divide between black men and black women when we all as black people are coming together to survive. But I, I wanna just go there a bit, you know, about this conversation that's happening, that there's this conversation that I believe this false notion that there's a divide between black men and black, black women. Um, 
And I just want to go there. Leah, um, you have an incredible lived experience and you've seen variations of this, this, this concept, this, this conversation. What, what are your thoughts on the current conversation and recommendations of how we get past that and actually get to the root of what we all are trying to do is move together as black people? You know, I think that one, we should try to separate fact from fiction and recognize that in this political moment, uh, where all it's this is for all the marbles, right? We play in this is this is high stakes. It is in the interests of some people who are not part of our community to uh, to manufacture, to exacerbate, uh, or to highlight one or two or three voices to try to say there's a divide. I think that that it, there was less of that than is reality and this is just a moment right now where it's advantageous for some people to highlight that. I do think that, that as I said earlier, sexism exists and our brothers are not exempt from that. It's a holdover from the 400 years, particularly the time of our enslavement when we were separated going into legislation that was enacted in the 60s after the Moynihan Commission, look that up, where it was more advantageous for our families, for the men to be separated from us. You actually could get better benefits from the government if there was no man in your house, if your husband was living elsewhere. That kind of divide that was created and nurtured by our government has helped to create a lot of the fractiousness that's going on. I think the way that we resolve it is continued conversation among us, I think there are more brothers who are more progressive than get credit for, but we've got to continue to highlight those voices, continue to be in conversation in honest dialogue, because there are some brothers who are difficult. There are some brothers who, you know, holding on to Donna Reed in the 50s. And listen, there are some sisters who sometimes ain't that helpful. <laughs> <laughs> but we got to talk. <laughs> got to have the family conversation, and sometimes people fall into the pattern without realizing they're in the pattern. So, out of love, going to my pastoral roots, out of love, you just like, did you mean to say that, brother, sister? Is that really what you intended to do? Because here's how it's coming to me. And I don't think that's what you mean. We have to continually have the family conversation and not be afraid and not demonize each other when we don't fall, when we fall short of what the, the goal is. Uh, thank you for that, Leah. Dr. Brown, so you've done extensive research and understanding, you know, what's really driving black women in politics, what's driving, what's the issues that are pressing based on everything that you study in your area of study, what, what are the policy issues and, and what are the issues that are really driving black women to these historic record turnouts and this uh, voting block that is just an undeniable voting block? So on the top part of the list for 2020 and from 2018 have been issues around racial justice, but a much more inclusive and expansive idea of racial justice. Um, so um, thinking about Black Lives Matter as not just um, violence, state-sponsored violence done to Black men and boys, but also the role of the state in killing Black women and girls. Um, is also um, killing of Black women and girls is also physical and metaphysical, right? So thinking about the high number of rates of Black women and girls who are incarcerated or suspended from schools um, as part of the racial justice mission. Tied with that is environmental justice, right? So understanding that people should have access to clean water, to, um, to live in neighborhoods that are not polluted or contaminated, really expanding the lens to environmental justice as a family issue, not just something that businesses, uh, businesses versus slave people, right? But really looking at it as a bread and butter issue for how do you protect your community for your family. And then some other very staple things are Education. Um, education since the 1990s has been something that Black women um, repeatedly have shown, black, black women elected officials have shown repeatedly through survey data and through my own uh, qualitative data is something that they care a lot about. But particularly in this time when Black women are being stretched so thin and trying to figure out how to homeschool, how to do uh, online schooling through COVID-19, 
um, and are, are still doing the care work for other people and other things in other places, education has been a renewed sense, um, a source of, of policy things that Black women are talking about this year. I think in ways that are much more dynamic than are getting uh, attention in the mainstream media. The last thing I'll, I'll note is healthcare. And again, healthcare has been a staple issue, right? This is something that's not going anywhere. But when we're looking at the disparate numbers of black and brown people that are dying of COVID and the number of black women who are also dying but are also caring for those who have COVID, right? Or seeing perhaps their health insurance be whittled away is, is something. And twofold part of this is what makes this so difficult to say these are the main issues, but because they're also overlapping, um, but home um, having um, housing insecurity, right? So women that I've talked to have see housing insecurity as a health issue, where I think in the past, in non-COVID non time, we would have thought of housing insecurity as a separate issue. But now when families are being um, pushed together because someone's been evicted, they can't pay their rent, they can't make ends meet on their mortgage, and now families are living together. What does this mean in a pandemic when we're all supposed to be in these kind of separate spaces to keep ourselves healthy, um, healthy and well? Um, so these are the issues that we're seeing in 2020. We saw some of them in 2018, um, particularly around Me Too and sexual assault and sexual violence. They've just morphed in ways, again, that Black women are talking about them in very dynamic ways that, um, again, white men, Black, white men, white women, Black men are not talking about, which is why we need to elect Black women. Important, important. Yes, we absolutely need to. Absolutely, it's an imperative. I think Ultimately, the old saying is that, you know, we, when, when you have Black women, when Black women enter, we see everyone. We see everybody in the room, and that, that is a constant. Ashanti, I, I want to come to you and just ask, you know, there are a number of, a historic number of Black women that are running up and down the ticket. Tell us about some of the Black women that are up and down the ticket on this November 3rd. If you haven't already voted, or if you have your ballot and you haven't turned it in, turn it in. Um, but if you're planning to vote on November 3rd, tell us about some of the women that are up and down the ballot. Oh my goodness, there's so many to name. Obviously, we know Senator Harris right there at the top. That's really great to say. There are so many women who are running for state house seats, and that is extremely important because redistricting is coming up. So we need to make sure that we're having really great women in those seats so we can get fair districts because we know that who do they always love to shortchange? It's the Black communities when it comes to redistricting. So making sure that we have Black women in particular at the table running for those seats. I'm really excited about the number of Black women who are running for law enforcement positions. This is something that I work on a lot at Emerge. I say that we can't change the criminal justice system without changing the faces of criminal justice reform. And that means we need more black women as judges, sheriffs, DAs. We know that 90% of sheriffs are white men. About 75% of prosecutors are white men. So when we talk about our criminal justice system, that's why it looks the way that it does. We need more Marilyn Moseys, Kim Foxes, Rachel Rollins, those are the women that we need to be electing. And then also at the city council level as well, women who are becoming the first black women in city councils that have never even seen a woman, but the districts are majority black people. Like that is real. So I know y'all are saying, why isn't she naming people? Cause there's really too many to name. I mean, I could give you all the merge alums, but that would be an entire hour. But it's really great to see that wherever you turn, there are Black women making a difference by winning these seats and thereby changing their communities. When we started Emerge, there were city councils where no women at all. We can talk about Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. She was the first woman, Black woman, on the Boston City Council. That city council is now majority women, majority women of color, and those are Emerge alums. And I say that because we also have to realize that this shift doesn't happen overnight. You have to be really strategic about what you're doing. And unfortunately, it does take patience to get it all done. But once it's done, the fact that you have now two women of color are running for mayor of Boston that are on that city council. Whoever thought we would say the day 
and their Emerge alums. I'll get that plug in. But that is what happens when we're able to recruit, train, and elect these women. And I have to talk about the fact that when we talk about representation matters, this is a big piece of it. In 2016, we had so many women who ran because they were inspired by Secretary Clinton. I now see the women who are running this cycle, they're running because they were inspired by the women that were inspired by Secretary Clinton. So there's this whole new generation, particularly of Black women, young Black women who are running because they see women who look like them, who have the same background from the family experience, from dealing with bankruptcy, homelessness, healthcare. It dispels that notion that you have to be a certain way in order to run for office, that you have to have it all together and you don't. There is literally no perfect candidate. I say that. The closest thing you're gonna get to a perfect candidate that you always agree with is yourself, which is why I say women need to put themselves on the ballot, you're the perfect candidate. But to have a record number of women, black women running again, is just truly amazing. Mm -hmm. Leah, I want to come to you. You wrote a book along with Yolanda Carraway and Donna Brazil and Mignon Moore um, entitled uh, Bacolic Girls Who've Considered Politics. Often when we have conversations about uh, politics, we focus on the candidate and running for office, which is very important. But equally as important are those that are in and around that are running campaigns, that are running policy operations. Can you talk to us a bit about your book, uh, the contents of your book, and the importance of Black women that shape uh, the political dynamic, that shape candidates, that shape the policy. Yeah, uh, happy to. And just before, if I could take one second and add on to Dr. Brown's list of critical issues, I want to surface one that I know is close to your heart, Joe Taker, and that is equity and access to technology. We are seeing that it's critically important, especially now in COVID as children are homeschooling and our children don't have equal access to technology either because they don't have broadband, the communities are not white or they don't have the equipment that's necessary. As you know, I do a lot of work in rural America and just having communities be wired. And unless, and let's remember in rural America, nearly 50% of rural America are people of color. So when we're talking about, we're not talking about some old white guy in a pickup truck. We're talking about our own people who don't have access and our communities cannot move forward and be part of the 21st century economy until we address the issue of equity and technology. I wanna shout out Michelle Jawando at Google who is doing great work with HBCUs around technology access, Tanya Lombard at AT&T, Tony Williams at Comcast, all doing great work and Fallon Wilson at Black Tech Mecca, yeah. who is doing amazing work bringing our people up to speed on technology. I want to flag that as, as an issue that's sort of underneath, but it powers so much else around equity and how our people move forward. For Colored Girls, we wrote this book because we wanted to share our experience of, of our friendship and how we navigated the American political system. Uh, thank you, Ashanti. <laughs> how we navigated the political system to help bring about change in our nation, uh, change inside the Democratic Party. None of us have run for office. Uh, my co-authors, uh, Donna Brazil, Mignon Moore, Yolanda Carey, none of us have run for office. We've always been background players. And so for, for sisters and brothers who are listening, you don't always have to run for office. It is often the staff it is mainly the staff a lot of times that is driving message, that's doing the ad buys, that are making the critical strategic decisions around a candidate platform, uh, how the candidate is moving in community, where the, and we're in the presidential now, where the candidate is going. The, the candidate has many other things to think about. They're not getting up in the morning and say, huh, I think I ought to go to, you know, Western Blue. That's a staff person. And so having the right team behind you, having a team that is knowledgeable about uh, policy, knowledgeable about platform, knowledgeable about polling and fundraising and or is critically important and often makes the difference in a candidate's success. 
And so I want to encourage people, look, read, of course, buy the book and read the book and you can get all the dirty details on the changes that we help to make inside the Democratic Party. But also, I want you to be inspired. I hope folks are inspired to say there's more than one way to participate. And even if you choose not to go into politics, you as a business person can lead fundraising for a political candidate. You as an educator can participate in the policy development for a candidate. It all connects in some way. And there is a place for you, a place for each of us to help move our nation and our communities forward. Well, thank you for that. Well, we want to make sure that we create time and space for questions from the audience. So if you do have a question in the audience, if you could just put it in the chat box and if that question is directed to a specific panelist, please uh, put it in the chat box for us. While we're waiting on questions, uh, oh, we do have a question. What lessons have we learned from the amazing freshman women members of Congress, particularly uh, Representative Presley, McBath, Hayes, Omar Underwood about being able to advance their agenda. I think there are lots of lessons. <laughs> uh, you've really lessons. done a great job of moving agendas. As, as someone who worked on the Hill for a while, I think being talking about the Hill and being on the Hill is two different things. And I think one of the first lessons all new members of Congress learn is that you better make you some friends because <laughs> you're not gonna pass any legislation by yourself. It takes 200, you plus 270 some others in order to pass something. So being able to work in coalition and in cooperation with others is critically important to getting anything done. Anyone else wanna chime in? A big piece of it too, for me, is they're still their authentic selves. They yeah. didn't change when they were elected. They haven't changed over these past few years. And that's a part of why they are effective. They said that they were going to do things. They continue to work on those things. And it goes back to what Bishop Daughtry talked about is their lived experience. They don't shy away from talking about that. And that relatability that is what gets people to call their members of Congress and say, you need to support this bill because what Congresswoman Presley said, I've gone through that. What Congresswoman Armour has said, I have gone through that. That is real life for Black people, for Black women, and this bill will advance. So I think that authenticity is such a huge part of why they're successful at being able to move their agenda forward. And I'll, I'll just quickly add that as a scholar, it's exciting for me to see this growing number of Black women in the CBC because it's a great research point, <laughs> uh, number one. But I think right, these women are changing and challenging what we think Black politics are, right? And so you see these internal kind of conversations that are happening in the CBC in particular, but moreover the Democratic Party. And it gives more data points for how what, what, what Black politics is and how Black folks show up to engage in politics and policy. Um, we don't, we're not relying on the original founders and the very small numbers anymore, right? We're seeing the complexities of what Black life looks like. And by having more women at the table, we're seeing these different policy things that would not have come up otherwise. I think so you raise it to that agile take is no, go right ahead. I have, I have admired their focus. And I think that's been critical because they are so high profile. All of the new members, whether it's Lauren Underwood, Ashley, uh, uh, um, uh, Ayana, Ilhan, they have had to be tremendously focused in the light of all of these people who have chosen to go after them and make them poster children. But what they remembered is who votes for them that ultimately they represent a set of voters in their district and that's who they serve. So who cares if the right wing person down in Texas somewhere don't like you, he ain't voting for you. They have been focused on the reason they went to Congress and the people who sent them to Congress in the first day, in the first place and they have not allowed themselves to get distracted. 
That's a very important point. And here's another question from the audience. Uh, it goes to the point that you raised, Leah, about concern with the digital divide in our community, especially as it relates to our children and the elderly in light of this dual pandemics. What policies can we support to address this? Well, I think from my vantage point, working in uh, doing a lot of work in rural America, one thing we can do from federal policy is we need to ask our government to ensure that every community has access. That means that the infrastructure must be built. And I believe that has to be a responsibility of the federal government, not of any particular corporation. If America is going to compete in the 21st and the 22nd century, it is in America's own best interest to ensure that every community has the actual cabling and wiring that is necessary before you can even get to, you know, how I in my home plug in. Uh, I think there can be workforce programs from the Department of Labor that ensures that people have the skills, that there are training facilities in communities that can help people gain the skills, particularly in industries where there is transition, such as coal, such as oil and gas, such as some of the manufacturing like steel. They need new skills. Workers need new skills. And being able to navigate technology is critically important. And it ought to be part of the curriculum in schools. People ought to know some basic, uh, some basic how you connect, but a little coding never hurt nobody. <laughs> Knowing how to code something here and there never hurt anybody. And it's the kind of skills that we're going to need as a country to keep up in the new economy. Yeah, if I could take some moderator's privilege, uh, growing up on a dirt road in South Carolina in a place where when it rains, the internet still goes out. There's a real need for infrastructure. Uh, if you can only just imagine there are you know, thousands upon thousands of kids that are going to school relying on just uh, unreliable internet in order to get the critical education that they need. So this is gonna have an impact on a generation to come where you're not adequately getting the education. And I would also take some moderators privilege just to speak on the notion of when we think about tech and access to technology in Silicon Valley, that there is clearly a leaky pipeline. You look at the statistics that black women, while we have the most successful uh, small businesses and businesses in the, in the nation, still we only represent less than 1% of venture dollars that are, are, are provided in Silicon Valley, that we represent less than 2% of the population in Silicon Valley, but yet we are consumers of technology. And it's not a lack of talent, it's not a lack of, 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 of opportunity for, for, for Black women. It is just a lack of us getting the access into the industry. So I think that there are certainly policies that we are seeing in California around mandates around women uh, on boards and ensuring that there's diversity on on corporate boards, I think we need more of those type of policies and also more pressure from the Congressional Black Caucus because it has been the pressure of the Congressional Black Caucus that has actually made Silicon Valley, having been a Silicon Valley exec myself, it has been when you have seen Congresswoman Maxine Waters come into your fintech company to raise questions that that fintech company then does change or when you have Congressman Butterfield come into your tech company and ask questions, that is when that company moves. So that is something that we need to continue to do. And I think really double down on the CBC Tech 2020 policy. So um, I just had to take some moderator's privilege of having and spent time on the tech there. The, yes, sister yeah. on the, the sister in the chat raised the issue of um, the elderly and, and, the, and other communities that might not. I want to surface one more and that's those recently returning citizens. Yes. Folks who are coming out, uh, coming coming home to us after having served their time, they a lot of them get out, and they get handed a flip phone. And how do you start a new life without the skills and with a flip phone? Uh, how do you look for a job? We all know that, but this is a community that is going to be left. Another community that's going to be left behind, and they, we need to think about how we integrate them better into uh, their new lives back at home. Thank you. I'll just quickly add to this. This is this is a distinct policy issue, right? Parties have different stances on, on um, internet access and broadband access. We've laid out all the reasons why, and it seems for some, right, that this is a no-brainer, right? That this is a sure shot argument. Um, 
I'm in Indiana and there's a large number of libertarians here who do not believe that the internet is a commodity that the government should have a hand in, right? And that uh, the internet should be the same thing that we think about when we say every, every house should have running water or electricity. So this is an issue that black women are championing in these ways, but remembering to speak to folks who are this other side of the spectrum, right? That this is a, is a policy issue that is different, has different, uh, different folks on the sides of politics and policy, right? And it's not just this given. We see the damage, we see what's happening, but we also have to understand that there are different sides of how uh, people believe the government should intercede into people's lives. And the internet is one key thing. I want to dive deeper in this question around policies. Uh, there are a lot of policies that are, you know, discussed and often, you know, we think about black women and we just think about black women as black women are just, we're the doers, we're the backbone. And as you laid out, Leah, we are not just the back backbone. Yes, we have been the backbone, but we also are the leaders. We set and define culture. There's so many things that black women do. But Black women also lead and define policy. There are a lot of Black women that are in the middle of policy, developing critical policy. And honestly, it's the policy that Black women have been at the table have been the policies that really take an all America forward. I want to just sort of go there. And if any of, any of the panel, panelists could speak to some of these policies that Black women are most concerned are policies that Black women are developing. I'll start. One here that I think is really important because we touched a little bit on the school to prison pipeline is you see it's actually black women who are introducing legislation around this, particularly to stop school suspension in pre-K, which is becoming the new start for the school to prison pipeline for black boys and girls. We used to say that it was third grade, but now it's happening early as pre-K. And when I look at the end of every session at legislation that Emerge alums are introducing, particularly Black women, it is to stop this. Because again, they're bringing that lived experience. It's nothing that other people are thinking about. So when we're talking about the whole criminal justice system, another way that Black women are leading on policy with that. And it goes back to when we talk about when women are elected office, they lead on women issues, but at the end of the day, those are all family issues. Those are community issues, paid leave, family leave, environmental issues, returning veterans. It's normally one issue that galvanizes a black woman to want to run for office. But when she's in there, it runs the gamut. She cares about everybody in the community. But if I had to highlight one policy, I think that is a really important one that black women are working on that isn't getting a lot of attention. Hmm. Anyone else want to dive in there? And I, I, I want to actually raise, in addition to the school to prison pipeline, it's just really the disproportionate effect on young Black girls. And Dr. Monique Morris has done amazing work on bringing this issue to light. Uh, there's not has There has not been as much focus. I think when we see just egregious cases, I think we all step up. But she's done a real great body of work really raising that issue as well. Alla had um, some comments around the Crown Act and Black women's pushing to um, put in some standards that say you can't discriminate against Black people by, because of the texture and the way that their hair grows out of their heads. This, um, right, this Crown Act was introduced by Holly Mitchell, a Black woman in uh, Senator in California. It's introduced in the federal, uh, federal level by um, Cory Booker and Cedric Richmond, right? So we know that Black men care about these too, but it was started by Black women. The initial sponsors throughout other states in New Jersey, New York were all Black women. I have a new book that's looking at this. And what is so heartening when I did this research is that Black women held these town hall meetings, right? And invited communities to come in and talk about why this bill was important. And Black women showed up and showed out. They talked about their experiences with hair-based discrimination and really enlightened um, you know, white male and, and white women um, legislators. They had no idea that this was an issue, right? They thought that race discrimination was ended um, in, in some other ways, right? And that this bill is seen as frivolous. But was um, in my case study of New Jersey, women talking about fearing that they won't find employment as medical doctors, as lawyers, right? And the other um, members in the room are thinking, 
oh, you have all the tools, you've succeeded, right? You've got this fancy degree, you've done all the things, you played by the rules. It didn't make sense that people would not get a job because of how they chose to wear their hair. So this is a kind of policy that black women have championed that other people, once they heard about and understood, right? It became a no brainer. And this is why this bill has been so successful around the, in the country in several states and municipalities. And I'm hoping that it'll be successful in Congress. Yeah, and it's actually around the world because now Jamaica is grappling with this issue and the conversation is in Jamaica and uh, Ajwa Asmoa, who's done an incredibly um, amazing job of just really championing that legislation and then also seeing uh, corporate corporate entities such as you know Dove and, and others get behind and Unilever get behind uh, a campaign celebrating uh, and champion black women and black women's hair but also uh, getting behind legislation around just the freedom to uh, just be and, and be a black woman in who all we are. Um, there's a, a question in the chat and I, I wanna get to this as we uh, have probably about 15 minutes left for this session. What advice would you give for dealing with white women who may not value our work, but also come to the table for the community? That's a very good one. Leah, I'm looking at you. Maybe, should I just end on you? I'm, I think we'll end on you. Ashanti, I'm gonna start with you on this one. Oh, I don't think today is the day to have me answer that question. Uh, <laughs> this is a very real thing. And I'm speaking as someone who is the first black woman to lead Emerge, which is still a predominantly white organization. And the fact is, if you're at the table for our community, but you don't value me, that means you don't value our community because I am a part of the community. So you should respect what I say and what I bring to the table. And when we talk about, you know, just politics in general, and when it comes to women running, the number of Emerge alums who have I've had come to me and say, well, they already told me that there's a black man in the race or there's already a person of color in the race, I shouldn't get in because it's covered. That's a serious problem. It goes back to the continued thinking that we're just a monolith. Our community is the same and that black people can't bring diverse experiences to the table. So for me, I'm extremely outspoken about it and I call it out. Something I've had to call out a lot is people who want to say, well, what do you think about Senator Harris and people say she's not black enough? And I tell them, you don't know how offensive that question is. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, let's think about what is Senator Harris? She's smart, she's accomplished. We heard Bishop Daughtry talk about how black women, they're bold, they're brave. So when you're saying that she's not black enough, what you're telling me is you don't associate those qualities with black people, especially black women, that you have stereotypes about who we are and how we should be. So calling it out is one of the biggest things that you have to do because at the end of the day, they leave the community as white women, but we stay in the community. And it's us pushing things forward that really gets things done. Dr. Brown, you've studied a lot. You research polls, information, enlighten us. So I use those, um, and I use those facts, right? These undeniable social science techniques to speak to what white women do and how they do it. And I learned that actually from black women candidates and elected officials themselves, right? Who say when they go to spaces where white women are trying, um, particularly in women's caucuses, right? Are trying to lecture them on what policies would be good in the community, uh, particularly things around, let's say, um, survivor, survivor networks or domestic violence advocacy. These women have gone back and said, well, let's look at how you voted and let's look at what your vote did to communities like mine. And they just use these straight facts, right? Like we can, we can break this down. So there's no question, there's no, there's no feeling behind this because what happens unfortunately is that black women's experiences have to be validated. They're seen as me studies, right? So if you have a problem with a white woman, a black man or someone else, right? 
you have to have someone else corroborate to say, oh yes, that was racist. Yes, that was sexist, right? There's like, there was some um, panel out there that was going to assess whether your claims are valid. I think black women are one of the only groups that this happens to. And so I do the same thing now in research, right? When um, in my particular subfield, general politics, white women were all um, surprised that Donald Trump won the majority of their vote um, in 2016. And we were able to show the receipts. White women have been slowly moving over to the Republican party since 1952, right? And they have not left the, the protective arm of white patriarchy. And so seeing um, voting for an Obama is a blip, right? The consistent actions of how they have voted, what they've supported in policy preferences, where they've donated money, shows us who they are as a voting bloc who they are as elected officials. So I'm able to show using trend data, using statistics, right? That we can't expect, right? A duck to do anything else than quack. So sometimes we are expecting people to behave otherwise because they share a gender. But we have to remember, right? That white supremacy and patriarchy is a hell of a drug, right? It, it pulls people in. And um, so leading with just hard basic facts, I think should, should be a way to help have inroads into these kind of conversations. Mm. Thank you, Leah. I went to a meeting um, post 2016 with a bunch of white women's groups and a few black women's groups to talk, they wanted to talk about what happened. So, you know, in this room of 50, there were three black women and they were doing, the white ladies did, I call them the white ladies, they did their analysis and one woman stood up and said, well, we want to help. And so we, we're committed to going into the community and working with people. We've set up offices in their communities and they can come to our meetings. And that's when I lost it. And what I said was, no, you can't come into our communities and tell us what to do. What you need to do if you want to be helpful is come to our meetings sit in the back and listen <laughs> so you can learn how to work with the, with, the, with the community that you have now decided to take residence in. My experience is that white women's allyship is situational yeah. because the patriarchy works for them. If it didn't work for them, they would have changed it a long time ago, but it works for them on many levels. So my own, what, what my experience and what I do is call it to their attention because they have been doing it so long and don't at me, I don't mean all white women don't at me, but most, they have been doing it so long that they don't recognize their own pattern and it has to be called to their attention. Otherwise they will continue to do the thing that has benefited them all these years. And that's where we gotta start sisters. It has benefited them. So they have, they are not incentivized to change it. We have to help incentivize them. And when they cross the line, of trying to interpret for us, speak for us, do for us, then we have to say, no, you can sit over here and you can support me in the way I say I need support. You can be part of this in the way that I allow you to be part of this if you're talking about what's good for me. But we can't allow, we cannot assume that they just gonna do the right thing, not because out of malice or ill will, but because they need to understand our opinion, that we can speak for ourselves and that we can dictate where and when we need their support. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good points. So I know we are nearing the end of this panel and we are just so grateful for all of your comments and your commentary and your brilliance. I want to round us out and just go around and just get some final thoughts from our panelists on this discussion of Black women mattering, this moment. What, what really is driving you? What, when you wake up, what are you excited about um, when you think about Black women and Black women in politics in this moment? I'll start with you, Dr. Nadia Brown. So I'm, I've been holding space with um, several millennial and, um, and Gen Z black women who have finding a hard time to square the circle around saving American democracy and, under, and seeing black women's lives be valued. 
And these conversations really came to a fore around the grand jury non-indictment of um, the murderers of Breonna Taylor, where the officer was indicted for endangering the life of her neighbors, but not for killing her. And black women are having, young black women are having this real, I think, come to Jesus moment where they're wondering what's at stake for me to show up and participate in a system that is guilty as hell from the bottom up, right? From the core to the outside. And what I would love is, right, politicians, the system, right, to, to, to sit deeply with this hurt that black women feel, the sense of betrayal. So they show up and show out in elections time and time again, right? They deliver key votes in states and races over to a party that yet doesn't seem to value their lives in very intrinsic ways. So for me, what gives me hope or keeps me up again is learning or thinking about ways to push our system to be more accountable, right? And to center, when we center black women, right? Anna Julia Cooper said, when and where I enter, right? And these are the kind of questions that I want to bring to my work, but also know that it has real life consequences, right? I want to be able to talk to folks who feel like this doesn't matter, that November 3rd doesn't matter. And it's not because they don't, they wanna see a Donald Trump second term. And it's not because they, they don't wanna see an historic first in Kamala Harris or that they were supportive of Joe Biden. The deep question is, why do we participate in a system that doesn't love us back? And so I wanna leave us with that because I think it's a, it's a larger question that helps us to think through as opposed to what can we do leading up to this election? So I put that out there in hopes of saying, maybe we'll have this conversation again post-election and then we can talk and continue to talk about these issues because I think that's really what's going to, to help keep our nation on the right track, right? When we center the lives of black women, I think we're moving in the right direction. Thank you, Ashanti. Mine is similar to Dr. Brown's. Being able to wake up every day and do this work, it brings me joy. And Attica Scott, who is the cur currently the only black woman serving in the Kentucky State House as an emerged alum, and she was arrested with her daughter when they were protesting the lack of grand jury action. And we had her on the podcast and we were talking about it. And she still continues to go out and there's these young black girls who are still organizing. And because they see her, they're talking to her about how do I move from protests to policies to elected office? So seeing how our representation is important, but also knowing that Representative Scott, she introduced Brianna's Law Kentucky to stop no-knock warrants. And it brings me back to if she was not in the state house, that law would not have been introduced. Mm -hmm. So even though we face all these barriers, we have all these battles with gatekeepers and white women, the patriarchy, us still showing up and getting things done leads to change. And that's why it's so important that we're there to do this work when it's not always sunshine rainbows and lollipops, but I'm joyful for the women who will show up and get it done because that's what we need right now. Thank you. Bishop Leah Dachu. The thing that drives me and motivates me and keeps me moving in these difficult days is of course the easy answer is my faith. But more important for me is, um, or as important are my nephews who for me represent the future. I am happily, joyfully child-free, but I got three nephews, 30, 16, and 13. I have a grandniece who's two and one more nephew who will be born in a couple of weeks. I do the work that I do for them so that their future is secure that they will have opportunities and that they will have a nation and grow up in a nation that respects their personhood, their manhood, their blackness. I don't need the nation to love me. I don't need the system to, to love me. I need the system to respect me. Mm. I, am, I, I have no hope that this system is gonna love me and I don't care because I don't love the system, but I want the system to respect who I am and my personhood. So the work that I do every day is about ensuring that my nephews 
and by proxy, all the children in my neighborhood, all of the children, my grown children who are making their way, all of my daughters who are making their way now don't have an easier time than I had. That's the way my parents grew up where the next generation is supposed to do better. Something has happened in the American society where that's no longer the norm. That's no longer our expectation. We just want our children to do as well. I want to restore the process in our hearts and in our minds that says, yes, my daughters should do better. And by and large, they are. They're, they don't, Joe Taker and Ashanti and Nani, they don't have to be in rooms by themselves anymore. Things have changed. When I was coming up, I was the only black girl in the room at the Democratic Party. That doesn't happen anymore. So every day I grow up, I come up joyful because Joe Taker and Ashanti and Nadia can go to meetings and not be the only one, that they can knock on doors and kick down doors. They're not the only one because they have this space now. And because of them, I know that my nephews, my grandniece and all the children in Brooklyn, New York, and across this nation are going to have a better life. And that's why I work as hard as I do. I fight as hard as I do. And I pray as hard as I do so that they will have an America where the promise of America is the practice of America. Well, thank you for that, Leah. And I would like to leave the audience with two pieces of advice or conversations that I had with mentors. One was in a conversation I said to a mentor, I said, I want to be like you when I grow up, when I get older. And she looked at me and she said, if you are like me, I would have failed you. May we internalize that. And finally, as Mignon Moore reminds us all, we should lift as we climb. Thank you all very much for this conversation. Thank you to our dynamic panel of brilliant, beautiful Black women. Bishop Leah Daughtry, Ashanti Golar, and Dr. Nadia Brown. I thank you all. I encourage you to follow the Congressional Black Caucus on all handles. Please share this conversation, reshare it on Facebook, on, on your social media platforms. Tell us what you thought about the conversation. Follow all of these amazing women on social media. You can find them, Bishop Leah Daughtry, Ashanti Golar, and Dr. Nadia Brown. And make sure you continue to follow the conversation with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, really bringing the policies and the politics to the people. I now turn it back over to the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Thank you so much, Ms. Edie, for leading like a dynamic conversation. I learned so much and I'm so inspired. I've already voted, but I encourage everybody to vote early and vote safely as soon as possible. This is, a, as you've learned, like this is an extremely important election. And as Ms. Ashanti said, there are black women all over, all over each ballot in every state. So please do your research and get out the vote. And I'd like to just end with um, some more sponsor remarks from STAR. So stay tuned for a special guest. Thank you. Hey everybody, I'm Lorenz Tate here to remind you it's time to vote. I made my plan to vote early and in person. You know what? I'm gonna need you to do the same. That's right, because now more than ever, we need everyone's participation. Vote for leaders who represent you. Your voice is your megaphone, so use it. Vote loud. So go ahead, set some time aside, mark your calendars, make those arrangements so that you can vote early and secure your right to vote.